This is the first day of this March 1981, Seven Days Hashin. And we will talk today about the three refuges. Reading from the Platform Sutra of Wei Neng, the Sixth Patriarch, in the Fang and Fang edition of the Buddhist Church of San Francisco. Before beginning with that, let's say a few words about listening to Teisho. First of all, always at the beginning of Teisho, take the most comfortable position that you can, using a bench if necessary, additional cushions, and also make sure that you remain in this comfortable position, not letting, not allowing the legs to fall asleep if possible. We talked about that recently when we were concerned with fire safety. In Teisho you have a possibility of changing your legs so that you don't have a numb one in case that fire bell should ever ring. Because in that case you probably hop out on one. In changing your position, it's a, it's a tremendous challenge. Can it be done quietly? Which means attentively. The attention being the practice, the who, the mu. If one is very attentive and observant, one, one, will, find, one will find in most of our motions, there is something extra. That extra being an image of oneself. I am changing my posture, either feeling ashamed or a little bit bashful about it, or else I am changing my posture. Yeah. Observe it for yourself. If that image isn't there, then there is quite a different change. One doesn't have to prove the existence of some entity which is just living in one's thoughts and ideas. And then every noise is no noise. It is quite natural. It comes out of silence. Moves within silence. What is listening? What is profound listening? If we're consumed with interest for something, we, we listen. As we say, we're all ear. But this is usually, if we want to get some additional knowledge to what we already have about something, Knowledge is possession, is security. It's, it's adding something to oneself. Because one can also, at appropriate or inappropriate times, exude it. Let others have it, share it. But oneself is still the owner of that knowledge. <coughs> this is why one is often so eager to find out new things, because one adds a little bit to oneself. If one is not interested, one usually does not listen, because one is too preoccupied with one's concerns about oneself, one's health, one's mental state, one's problems, one's mortgage, <laughs> whatever, the children. One is so concerned about one's children that one cannot observe one's children. They may not be any longer the way one thinks they are or they were. They may have changed. Maybe doing something else which is worrisome. Or not. Listening to Teisho. Can one be all there?
the personal concerns in abeyance somewhere on the periphery without without concern listening not only to the words which one may know well enough one has heard them over and over but working with them looking inside whether within oneself one can see what these words point at What Wei Nang says about the three refuges is within the chapter on repentance and resolution. We have frequently read from that chapter much more often about repentance, resolution, and the four vows, maybe only once about the three refuges. Virtuous and learned counselors is how Wei Nang addresses this audience of people who have gathered, many of them apparently teachers, all of them respected. We take refuge in Bodhi because it is the ultimate of both merit and prajna. We take refuge in perfect view because it is the ultimate of the abandoning of desires. We take refuge in equanimity because it is the ultimate quality even among large numbers of people. Now, later on in the pages, he will enlarge <coughs> upon this. But these are, in all simplicity, Wei Nang's formulation of the three refuges. We take refuge in Bodhi. The footnote here on Bodhi. <coughs> meaning knowledge which is, of course, not book knowledge, not accumulated knowledge, which is stored away in the computer up here. Understanding, understanding, by which is not meant just intellectual understanding, although that is not excluded. And perfect wisdom. Perfect wisdom not meaning, again, what one has accumulated, remembers, it is all clarity of seeing in which there is no division, no partiality. No shadow cast by any me, because in perfect wisdom and understanding there is no me point of view. There is no point of view. There's wholeness. Inside and out, there is no inside and out. There's wholeness. It is also the name of the tree under which the Buddha attained enlightenment, the Bodhi tree. But it is not the tree that Wei Nang here refers to. We take refuge in Bodhi because it is the ultimate of both merit and prajna.
Merit. Here in the annotation says virtue, moral excellence, which means not morals which are set by society, which are arbitrary, relative. What's immoral in one society is amoral in another society. Or what is moral in one society, not to kill, is also immoral in one society, namely not to kill, is also very moral and decorated with strings of orders when it comes to warfare. It's not this moral excellence that is being talked about. It's the excellence of no self-centeredness, no seeking for one's own advantage. of not abusing or exploiting others for one's own benefit. In Buddhist terminology, this has some special implications. Merit, virtue, implies not only that benevolent actions are done without any expectation of reward. Not only that. In doing something, can one see very honestly the expectation of reward? See it, not condemn it. See that it is there, then it will not deceive one about oneself. And in that seeing without deception, there's no reward. There is what is, and it is clear and true. Implies not only that benevolent actions are done without any expectation of reward, but also the inward merits which pertain to the freeing of one's mind from all attachments. Attachment to reward, how one needs it. An encouraging look. Why? There's nothing wrong with it, but why? One must find out. One must be aware of it. The attachment to reward. The attachment to it. It's a wonderful thing to be told thank you and then to leave it there and if it doesn't come to leave it not to hanker not to to chalk it up this person has not thanked me yet next time he does something for me I'll show him how it is not to be thanked we work on that level very subtly and very unaware because we don't want to be that way in our ideals and ideas so we don't see it and so we perpetuate it and continue this way. The first step is the discovery of all that. Everything flows from that discovery. Understanding of oneself and everyone else. And out of this understanding comes love. Embracing. Rather than pointing and blaming and hatred, upset about others' faults. Also refers to inward merits which pertain to the freeing of one's mind from all attachments, delusions, erroneous views back to its original priestin status of clarity and quietude. We take refuge in Bodhi. And 
understanding, discovering about oneself, in all honesty, fearlessly, taking in one stride the humiliation, humiliation or feeling ashamed or guilty comes because of ideals one has about oneself and the fear of how one may look to others if one does not put on a good-looking facade front. And yet keeping that facade up is a lifetime of futile work. It always crumbles, always has to be patched, and yet somebody may yet somebody may yet peek behind it, see through it, and discover one. Understanding. I take my refuge in understanding myself. Socrates already admonished everyone who would listen on the marketplace, know yourself. As you are from moment to moment, honestly, frankly, openly, fearlessly, And there's no need to deceive yourself, no need to deceive others, because the others are no others. They've got the same problem of trying to hide behind an image. Our first refuge, the way we recite it, is I take my refuge in Buddha and resolve that with all beings I will understand the great way whereby the Buddha seed may forever thrive. To be very attentive and aware and careful what builds up in the mind when one says, I take my refuge in Buddha. Because since time immemorial, we have taken refuge in an outside agent, a god, someone, something stronger than we, bigger, better, more holy, more complete, omniscient, omnipotent, who will look out for us, after us, who will protect us, help us. And in taking refuge in this entity, where is the work in oneself? Where is the looking into oneself? You heard the words in the beginning, the opening, at the ending of the opening talk, the Buddha admonishing everyone not just to take refuge in someone out of reverence, but to understand for oneself what is good and what is false, to be a lamp unto oneself. One time he said, do not just repeat my words out of the reverence that you have for me. Repeating is perpetuating ignorance about oneself. Why does one need to repeat? That's what needs to be looked into. That's important. One's dismal insecurity, feeling of inadequacy, and then the covering up by all kinds of beliefs and others who 
don't have this inadequacy and can fill mine up with something or other. I take my refuge in Buddha. We don't say in the Buddha anymore. In Buddha. When Buddha was asked, who are you? He said, I'm awake. Can one take one's refuge in wakefulness? Wakeful to one's escapes, gross and subtle. Wakeful to what is actually there. It can be seen, it can be gotten in touch with. Only this way can one go beyond. Resolve that with all beings I will understand the great way. What does this mean? I resolve with all beings. Is it the comfort of being with others? There's great comfort in being with others. But does one have, doesn't have to resolve alone that one, would under, that one will understand the great way. There's true aloneness, which means no dependency. The fears are faced. They don't turn one. They don't haunt one. They're faced, looked into. And the practice, the fear is the moo and the who. What is it? If there's this aloneness of working, then this aloneness is all oneness. Then all beings are not opposed, and there is no opposition. There are only all beings, as they are. And there's an embracing, lovingly, compassionately, of all beings as they are. One is able to stand alone, completely alone, dependent on no dogma teaching, Buddha, Dharma, or Sangha, and yet working within, within and within. Related to others, not in terms of what they can do for me, but in seeing others as they are, as one sees oneself as one is. Out of that comes a completely different relationship. Rather than wanting to make other people over or rejecting them. Resolve with all beings that I will understand the great way. The great way, what is it? Seems so remote at times. What is this great way that I'm supposed to understand? The great way starts each instant of living. It is clarity and understanding 
each instant of living. Not tomorrow or in a few years, maybe I'll find the great way. It's here now. Not really knowing what it is. I don't know what the great way is. It is not difficult if we do not choose. Much easier say what the great to say what the great way is not. One is entrapped by all of those things which the great way is not. Prejudices, preferences, like and dislike. Maybe that's the great way. <coughs> For by the Buddha seed may f may forever thrive. What is this Buddha seed? Bodhi understanding, one glimpse of oneself, one clear glimpse, without any deception, without any judgment, without any comment, one glimpse in silence. Could that be the Buddha seed? that it may thrive. How does a seed thrive? Put a little stick, a little seed into a little pot. Get nice soil. Stick it in, cover it up. You water it, put it in the windowsill or outside, and you watch it. Take care of it. You observe it. And one day there'll be something sticking out of the soil. And what joy. It takes great care. If you don't observe that seed, it'll die. Because you'll forget to water it and see what it needs. Can one observe not only what other people do, one may be very good at that, very, very sharp, but observe what is going on inside with no idea of how one is, no conclusions, no conclusions, no fixed ideas about oneself. Because what you were yesterday, you're not today. Observe, you must be awake. I take my refuge in wakefulness, in attention, in awareness, and in loving care of this Buddha seed. <coughs> so it will thrive. Grow healthily get the right nutrients. Not just what comes in through the mouth, but also through the ears and eyes. Uncolored untinted, direct,
we take refuge in perfect view because it is the ultimate of the abandoning of desires. Here, Wei Nang does not say take refuge in Dharma. Dharma being a Sanskrit word which many other meanings or translations also means order. Adharma meaning disorder. The ancients actually before there was belief in gods at one point in human history amazingly enough they were already sort of astronomers that observed the sky tried to find out the order of the universe and adjust life on the human earth according to this cosmic order. And we find this word order in many different cultures. Egyptian, Babylonian, Chinese, Tao, it's in Chinese, the Tao. And in India it was Dharma. The order of the cosmos, which includes the order of the human life. Unfortunately, it usually does not. Perfect view is this total view, including everything. Vastness of space, the stars, the skies, the clouds, nature, the birds, animals, children, everything. With no partiality, nothing cut up, which happens the minute oneself steps in with one's wishes and fears. Then there may be a mini-order, ordering one's life around one's own tendencies and proclivities. But may have nothing to do with universal order. As a matter of fact, it is very likely that it is in contradiction to somebody else's concept of order. Already among husband and wife, there's such different ideas of what is order. And there's hassling about it. Perfect view, I take my refuge in perfect view, which means no obstruction. No limitation imposed by selfishness, which means one must see selfishness and the limitations that it imposes. It's only out of seeing this oneself that there comes great urgency to see through it, to be done with it as it arises, not to fall for it. Not because one has been preached or coerced or prodded or one has compelled oneself, one has taken refuges and, and what have you. Resolutions, repentances. But because one sees the danger of one's living. One's own life and to that of others. because there has been a, a glimpse of perfect view in which there is no me. Things as they are, not clinging to them and not rejecting them. This is no moral preaching, this is working. working with great intensity, with this consuming interest to find out who and what one is. Unless one knows that, one does not understand this world, the 
the world seems such an incredible chaos and confusion, which it is. But we always say, I just don't understand how this is possible. Look into yourself. Maybe you can understand how it's possible. breaking down all facades, discarding all ideas of how one should be. That's the obstruction. We take refuge, oh, let's go back to our vow. Take my refuge in Dharma and resolve that with all beings I will enter deeply into the Sutra treasure, whereby my wisdom may grow as vast as the ocean. Not to misinterpret or misunderstand what one is reciting daily. What does it mean to enter deeply into the Sutra treasure? Many of you probably are wondering what it means. Nobody ever has asked me once, what does it mean? Here every day I say, it's kind of a vow, no, a resol resolution, I may enter deeply into the sutra treasure. What is the sutra treasure? Because we're reading here from a sutra, Does it mean that I have to study the Buddha's words, work hard to understand them? They are so difficult to understand. The translations are so difficult. The very form, the very format in which they were written down is very difficult to enter deeply into. It's been said by every great master that you are the sutra treasure. There's not a word recorded in any sutra that does not refer or point to you yourself, to your own mind. If it does not point to your own mind, then it is embellishment, and one need not hassle with it. And there have been all kind of things added, no doubt about that. Enter deeply into the, into the treasure of your own mind, which is saying too much already to you, it probably is anything but a treasure. More like a garbage can. <laughs> well, a garbage can too can be a treasure. One can look at things. There's a beautiful poem of a contemporary poet about a manure pile seeing it with innocent eyes and describing this whole process of decaying, the bugs in it, not seeing things for what they should be or were, but what they are right now. So that my wisdom may grow as vast as the ocean. Doesn't mean so many books could be written upon, about it that they could fill a space as vast as the ocean. We may come to that, although we now make books smaller and smaller. 
Amazing how, I don't know, what one little head of a pin can contain in information. Our libraries one day are going to shrink and contain that much more information. But this wisdom, this vast, vastness of mind is wisdom because there's nothing in it. No preconceived ideas. That's wisdom. Starting from scratch, not knowing. The seeing being in vastness. Nothing impinging. What one wants something to be, what one hates something to be, or oneself. Entering deeply into the Sutra treasure, entering through seeing. The clarity of that being the Sutra treasure. And our form is no form. Garbage is no garbage. We take refuge in equanimity because it is the ultimate quality even among large numbers of people. We say, I take my refuge in Sangha, in its wisdom, example, and never failing health. Help. And resolve that nothing will. What is it? Something with progress. Impede my progress toward full enlightenment. take refuge in equanimity, which is the ultimate quality even among large numbers of people. Take my refuge in Sangha. What is the Sangha? Living in Rochester, just having come to live in Rochester full time, there's no question about what Sangha is. It's warmth, never failing help. It's openness and friendliness. So need one to take one's refuge in that, it's there. Does one need to depend on it? Of course one depends. Why? Because one cannot stand alone? And the Sangha, the Sangha specifically, all that one takes one's refuge in? been told by different people that at certain times advice was given to them to be careful not to choose their friends from outside the Sangha. That's not the meaning of Sangha. Sangha is all humankind. Can one take one's refuge in no division? Don't say yes too quickly. 
rather observe all the divisions, all the clannishness, sectarianism, tribalism, all this heavy, heavy conditioning within all of us. Which is the cause of division in this world and of wars. Religious wars. Is it possible that, there, that one can fight a religious war? On a large scale or on a very subtle scale? We take refuge in equanimity, which means even-mindedness, even, even-mindedness. Even which is the ultimate quality among large numbers of people. It really is not most of the time, but within oneself is there this even-mindedness. Not just identifying with a small circle of congenial friends, colleagues, family, identifying with them. This is still ego. It's a prop. Can one live among small or large numbers of people without any need to identify with them? Not identify with anything. What is there to identify with? Who is there to identify? Identification is always duality. Me, insufficient me, and what I need to identify with so I become more sufficient. So I become somebody in the light of this. Then one's deep problems have not been tackled, have not been seen, have not been understood, which is dangerous. We will end here for today and continue tomorrow. <clears throat>